customers to have free access to vitamins and minerals, and she had unilaterally yanked that from the final reports. This attitude by Ms. Yetley, who is an employee of the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, is reflective of Codex meetings in general. In an attempt to shine light on those who are unilaterally making public policy in private, health freedom advocate John Hamill took a small video camera into two Codex meetings in 1998. These grainy videos are all that remain of the tapes, which mysteriously disappeared. Moving on, agenda number five on uh, vitamins and minerals. So are we going to strike that second paragraph? Well, these are draft positions. They don't have a draft position. So they're not, a, not the final nor the formal position. We've seen the letter from Ron Paul then. And this was signed by Ron Paul, uh, Congressman Stump, and Congressman Cook. We have received a lot of mail. We've been sent all of it. And you acknowledge that this represents the will of the American people and the will of Congress, correct? There's a wide range of opinions in this one. Despite multiple written requests and the intervention of a U.S. congressman, the FDA refused to answer any questions about codex, dietary supplements, or even labeling for this documentary. But judging from his rare interview with Michael R. Taylor, then Deputy Commissioner for Policy at the FDA, it is apparent that the agency is unaccustomed to meaningful questions about health policy by the media. It, you stated your concern, and the FDA certainly has, on, on mm -hmm. L-tryptophan. Uh, what about your concern regarding something like Prozac, a very well documented 28,000 mm -hmm. adverse reports, uh, uh, 1,600 suicides mm -hmm. associated with that drug? <coughs> Um, we had drugs that go through our uh, very rigorous uh, testing and, and review process are very well understood chemicals and drugs are recognized to have both risks and benefits. Uh, that's why they go through a rigorous evaluation and when those products are put out on the market, we have a good scientific understanding of both the risks and benefits and that's laid out in very detailed labeling that physicians then use to decide whether to prescribe those products for their patients. Side effects are part of pharmaceuticals. That's recognized, and that's why we're so careful scientifically. There's just no comparison between that situation and what we are dealing with with dietary supplements, which have not been subjected to that kind of study, have not been evaluated by FDA. And a large part of the problem with these supplements is that we simply don't know uh, about their safety. We don't know about their benefits, uh, yet they're being out there marketed uh, for, in some cases, for serious disease-related purposes. It's a big difference. Well, obviously, they, they would say something <clears throat> along the lines of that it was the only natural alternative to some of these kinds of, of drugs, mm -hmm. and, and that's a concern to people that want natural alternatives, right. I suppose. Right. Um, and since the, case, the cases against Prozac have been so high, mm -hmm. um, people would question whether or not the health uh, risks of L-tryptophan again, versus a, a Prozac and right. that kind of usage is uh, judged under the same standards, if you will. Well, he mentioned L-tryptophan, and it just... Uh, As the producers tried to get an answer from the Deputy Commissioner of the FDA, so it really Mr. Taylor seemed to lose his patience with the tone of the interview. Mentioned, so I, I thought Why I would follow up on it. Sir, right. Kurt, turn the camera off. We can talk. You know, I'm happy to talk about this. I don't want to spend the whole morning on it. But of course, Mr. Taylor was anything but happy to discuss the safety record of Prozac versus the amino acid L-tryptophan, which the FDA banned outright when Prozac was approved by the agency. And it is important to note that the Food and Drug Administration has assigned Mr. Taylor's wife, Christine Lewis Taylor, to the World Health Organization, where she is now chairwoman of the Nutrient Risk Assessment Project. I don't think that you can say that anybody at FDA has ever been a friend of dietary supplements. Anybody. They are friends of the, the classical reductionist scientific system that is based on cause and effect and uh, doing a bunch of huge and costly studies, which are the backbone of the pharmaceutical industry, which are the, which are the driving uh, force of our healthcare system, which is driving us into bankruptcy and killing between 200,000 and 700,000 people a year. Some of them honestly believe in the useless medication. More, however, are bunkum artists without pity or conscience, willing to risk the lives of fellow human beings to line their own pockets. Institutional hypocrisy and bias are endemic at the agency. 
In fact, the FDA has made no secret of its intentions to harmonize the U.S. vitamin and mineral standards with Codex, thereby reducing the dosages of common vitamins and minerals to ridiculously low levels. They've said so before Congress, in the National Register, and even on their own website. That system is not a good system, and the dietary supplement guideline, the vitamin mineral guideline, mimics the ideas of that system and tries to push them onto the international stage for vitamins and minerals. Bad thinking all the way around. We are at a stage in society when a large number of people, consumers and patients, are waking up to the fact that the healthcare system that they've placed their trust in now for decades is not delivering the healthcare that they need. They're beginning to appreciate that very often if they have major diseases like cancer or heart disease, that the so-called solution to these diseases is in fact killing them. Today, all new drugs must be proved safe and effective before they can be marketed. In other words, the medicine must be safe and must do what's claimed for it. This is why we see this incredible growth in consumer demand for natural products. And of course, just as the consumer is starting to make decisions about what they want to do in healthcare, the regulators have decided with a lot of pressure from big industry sectors to say, you can't have it. It's reserved for us. When the WTO, the World Trade Organization, became a reality in the 1990s, the power of Codex was heightened immeasurably. This new worldwide body, devoted solely to the harmonization of trade standards, gave Codex the enforcement capability that had eluded it for decades. Two U.S. congressmen, a Democrat and a Republican, have a philosophical divide on free trade, but agree completely on the dangers of the WTO and Codex. Now, the WTO is said to be set up for free trade. And I happen to like free trade. I like low tariffs, and I like goods and services flowing across borders. Uh, I studied economics in college. I'm a skeptic of the whole theory of free trade, and it really crystallized around uh, the NAFTA and the WTO agreements. I am a champion of national sovereignty, so I do not like the idea of getting involved in what the founders called entangling alliances. So I remember talking uh, to uh, Mickey Cantor, the president's uh, special trade representative, and I'd studied a little bit, and I said, I can't understand how we're going to bind ourselves to this agreement, which has a secret dispute resolution process, uh, which has no r rules regarding conflict of interest, and they will essentially preempt U.S. law. And then when you go to the next step of becoming a member of the World Trade Organization, means to me that we as a people and as a Congress, uh, we give up too much of our responsibility and our prerogatives. No, oh, no, no, you don't understand. They can't preempt our laws. I said, oh, you're right. They can just fine us for having our laws, and we can pay perpetual fines because we have laws that protect consumers of the environment, or we can repeal our laws. But now we're talking about turning over to a world organization that's going to force harmonization. So it, it's working as designed, as far as you're concerned, which is to protect corporate interests and uh, overrule governments and stick it to consumers. And they'll do that under the name of free trade and globalization and pretend that they're on the, on, on the side of, of, of freedom. But actually, they're, they're not. They're on the side of regulations and special interests and protection of uh, certain big corporations. If there's a higher corporate good to be served by breaking the law, by having the FDA, uh, you know, uh, work uh, with uh, the Codex and uh, try and drag the U.S. into this uh, nightmare, then uh, they're all for it and they're doing it. So we do what the WTO tells us, and that's why I'm very leery of the WTO, and I just assume we get out of the WTO. This would be like the ultimate reaching of government uh, into our personal health lives, uh, which would be unbelievable, and, and not even our government, some, you know, bureaucratic, diffuse, uh, multinational, secretive government. It's the power that's in the WTO that we have to deal with ultimately, and I don't like the trend. On Capitol Hill, legislators are now debating the merits of yet another trade agreement called CAFTA the Central American Free Trade.